The morning of the 7th of July was the same as same as you know, a million other mornings. Walk up here, book on with the with the manager, have a chat with the lads, get the the road number where the train where the train is. Then um, nice stroll down the Yale, which is about three quarters of a mile, which is a nice stroll early in the morning. But it wasn't that day because it was quite drizzly. At a quarter to six, Jeff Porter picked up his Circle Line train and set off on the first circuit of the morning. That time of the morning, there's, there's not too many people about. There's not too many trains about, so it tends to run fairly well. And that morning, I was on time the entire time. I'm running a couple of minutes early most of the time. So my duty would have would have had two circles before getting off for, for breakfast at Edgeware Road. Gary Stevens is a duty station manager at Russell Square. I started work at approximately half past seven. It was um, on the way in, a normal day, really. Just looking, coming in, thinking, planning me day as it was an early term. Thanks a lot. Gary's first job of the morning was dealing with a faulty Piccadilly line train. I then come upstairs, started me a uh, normal office band duties. It was a, a, a quiet morning and um, Yes, so in fact, it was boringly quiet. Celia Harrison was supervising the station at Allgate. It's just an office, it's not really a control room. That's where I was. We have two screens. We also have a, a computer with something called Tracker on it, which indicates which trains are where, what the train numbers are, um, so we can see how far away our next train is and can match up the drivers with the correct trains. Ellen Brush was on her way to a meeting. She'd boarded a crowded train at Finsbury Park. But it was incredibly busy um, and I got down onto the Piccadilly line station just as the train was coming in and in fact I was going to get on the second carriage but I don't know for some reason even though it was really busy in all the carriages I decided to fight my way down the back and ended up getting I think in the second or third carriage from the back and I was reading about how London had just got the Olympics the day before, you know, so I'm standing there reading. During the morning rush hour, London Underground operates over 500 trains on 12 lines. Any problems on the system are reported to the network control centre where the response is coordinated. Darren McCluskey was the manager on duty that morning. Reasonably normal morning, you know, the normal line was suspended. On top of that, we had a defective train on the Piccadilly line at Caledonia Road on the eastbound. While that incident was going on, we had another train on the Bakerloo line at, oh, I can't remember now, Piccadilly Circus, that became defective. So all this was all going on at the same time. Anything that stops a train running 
We get car loans. Anything that stops London, basically, isn't yeah. it? Any, anything, anything in London where that was just... Nobody knows we exist, I don't think, except for people on the underground and tube lines. No, gen gen general public, no, I don't think the general public don't, general don't know. They don't know. They don't even know. You know, you know. The Emergency Response Unit, or ERU, is the underground's dedicated team of emergency engineers. They specialise in moving and securing damaged trains and equipment. Joe Walsh is the ERU team leader at Acton. Well, on the day of the 7-7, we was uh, on a training course uh, here in this building here. The ERU regularly instruct the emergency services in specific techniques for rescuing people caught under trains or in tunnels. We're going to move them down a couple of feet so the dock's going to then get in the space between the, uh, the platform. We train the fire brigade, the ambulance, the police. So they, they used to confine spaces for one because that's a, that's a big thing on the railways, confined spaces. Darkness is another thing. You can't literally move under there, do you know what I mean? Which is another thing. Good effort. Thank you, Hems. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, cheers, yeah, thanks, I'll see you uh, later on this week, yeah? Right oh, then. Uh, see you later. Yeah, Ta-da. Pull it. Pull it through the block. It's quite a long time. I mean, I've been on the train since probably about half past five when I've actually jumped on it and started to prepare it till this is, this is ten, to, ten to nine, so that's quite a, a little a pe period of time. So, I mean, my, my thoughts were totally focused on breakfast. I mean, that was the whole, you know, my whole world. <laughs> the train left King's Cross and I can remember thinking, oh, thank God, it's only two more stops until Holborn and I can change. And I always remember, also remember thinking, it's incredibly crowded today. If something was to happen, it'd be awful. Between Paddington and Edgware Road, the Circle Line intersects two other lines at Prade Street Junction. As I was coming up to Bray Street Junction, I could see that all the platforms at Edgware Road in front of me were, were full. As I say, it was probably a minute or two early. So there were two district line trains in the, mid, in the two middle platforms, and there was a, uh, an eastbound train in, in platform one. So as I was coming up to the signal that protects the platforms, I was, I was slowing down for it and uh, getting ready to stop. And I saw an inner rail circle line train leaving from platform four on uh, Edgware Road. You can actually see the platform, I saw it come around the corner. Thinking about, I think it, it didn't. It didn't seem like not quite right as it was. As it was like, but I couldn't couldn't say what it was. There was a bright yellow light on the train, and then uh, then there was just smoke and dust and the noise of. It sounded like somebody had dropped a scrapyard on the track. The train just came to this like amazing halt. It's kind of a muffled woomph and everything shook. And it was just a moment of quietness, just a moment, um, and then it vanished. At Aldgate, Celia Harrison was one of the first people above ground to know that anything was wrong. But all the power went. We heard the explosion. We didn't know what it was at the time. And, um, in fact, Steve, my um, station assistant, rushed into the room and, and said, what on earth was that? And we sort of all rushed out to see what we could see. We could see smoke beginning to come out, but we couldn't see what had gone on. We didn't know that there was even a train there. Celia called the line manager to report the power failure. This was the first indication Darren McCluskey at the Network Control Centre had that anything was wrong. 8.50, that's when we got the first calls relating to um, an explosion or a loss of traction current at Allgate. We've lost traction current, nothing more, nothing less. We, we know we've lost traction current, we don't know why we've lost current. Reports of loud explosion, fine, but an 11 kV HC ca cable will, when it ruptures, will make that sort of noise. So it's all consistent at the moment. It's consistent with a power surge or a power problem. 
the power supply problems were not confined to Allgate. I had a call at 8.54 from the Northern Line telling me that they'd, lost, they'd had a power surge and lost current as well. Around 8.56, this message went out that there was a major power failure had occurred and it affected a large area of the underground. At about the same time, Gary Stevens was on duty at Russell Square when a group of passengers reported a loud noise from the westbound tunnel. The customers indicated that this is where the bang had come from. Um, myself and Dave Boyce, we walked down to here. We was looking at the rails to see if there was anything untoward. We couldn't see any indication of anything that was wrong. Gary and Dave then noticed lights in the tunnel coming towards them from the direction of King's Cross. It took about five to six minutes before the driver and the injured parties got to us. It was then we realised something, something had gone wrong, big time. The driver had led out as many of the passengers as he could from the front of the train. He didn't say it was a bomb, he just said that uh, something terrible's happened. I'm, I'm not sure what, but something terrible's happened. There's people down there, they need help. I then jumped down and um, made my way to the affected train. Once we got to the train, I um, instantly realised that something terribly had gone wrong. And um, right in front of me, there was a young lad who'd had his leg blown off. I came down here, say about two minutes after the blast. Um, the train crew who were in this office here um, were already out and down the tunnel. Um, they were absolutely fantastic, so quick. At Edgware Road, manager Steve Gosker was starting to see passengers emerge from the bombed Circle Line train. So this was the main area of activity, um, these stairs, because um, by the time I got down here, um, I could see the train down the tunnel there. 907 get a call from Steve Gosker. He doesn't know what's gone on down there, but there's a lot of people coming out with blackened faces and covered with blood. Ah, this was the first, I, I said to him, does it look like an explosion? And he, he even then, putting the words into his mind, he, he, he said something's gone badly wrong down there. We don't know what it is. You have to imagine that Steve's there and, you know, a professional level-headed railway operator. But what he's seeing is something that he's never seen before. And he can't... It's not adding up. It's not put... You know, he can see people coming out and they are walking, they are wounded. So he, he needs to gather his own thoughts and actually have a good picture of what's actually going on. Uh, they were walking along the edge of the wall there, um, very orderly but obviously some quite bad injuries, um, very uh, burnt sort of faces and cuts and bruises. There's very narrow gangways between each, each, each car. There's a lot of trip hazards, which is why I was you know, impressing on people all the way while we were getting them out, that, you know, go slowly, you know, watch where your feet are, you know, that's, that sort of thing. And uh, it's a very narrow, rickety staircase in the front of the train, and so it's, it takes quite a while to get people out, so there's no way, really, we could have evac evacuated people any, any quicker. Gary still had a long walk ahead of him from the platform at Russell Square. The train is approximately 650 metres from our westbound platform, so it took us quite a while to get there. The further we went into the tunnel, the harder it was to see, and at one point we couldn't see further than a hand. Five minutes later, he reached the train. And it's a sight I'll never forget for the rest of my life when I got in that first carriage. Uh, the roof of the train was completely gone. There was very seriously injured people and had parts of their limbs missing, obviously fatalities, things like that. Um, I just walked to the people who I thought needed my help the most. Not that I could do a lot, but I just gave them reassurance spoke to them, told them not to worry. There was help on the way, please bear with us, there are people coming. This lasted for approximately 40 minutes. I was down in the tunnel on my own. Because I was at the back of the train, we were all taken out down to King's Cross. And there were these two enormous, enormous blokes who just heaved people up, up, up the, you know, from, the, from this very deep, you don't realise how deep it is. So to see the underground staff was enormously reassuring. Um, and they were so calm, even though they didn't know what the hell was going on. And, you know, they were incredibly calm. And I think if they'd shown any hint of 
panic or um, not being able to cope, it would have just been dreadful for everybody. It would have kicked something off. We'd known by now that we had three incidents, all reporting large explosions. And this is the first time we've been involved with this is terrorist activity. We decided from then we'd go through the code amber. London, the whole network's closed and crashed. Code Amber is an emergency procedure in which the entire underground network is evacuated by the quickest possible means. This was the first time many passengers above ground were aware of a problem. By that time, emergency services had arrived on the scene. What I think was probably so amazing was that now, all the underground staff who had been there for the first however long it was by ourselves sorting things out in our, in our, in our flimsy uniforms and then there were all these people with you know, huge great coats and, and breathing apparatus and all sorts of gear. You know, it looked, looked like they'd just landed from another planet. The ERU were called off their routine training to attend. Joe Walsh's team was sent to Edgware Road. Yeah, there's people in, the, in mass suspensers, they're in this, this building here. I'm in the uh, station four course, so hopefully, you know, there's nobody seriously injured, but looks like there is, but our blocks are down there, they're training the passengers at the moment. And what was the actual size of the explosion? We don't know at the moment, oh, can't really say. It was only then that the scale of the destruction started to become apparent. There was the explosion and um, blew the back windows out of ours and we got covered in glass and everything, but the second carriage was pretty badly damaged. It was, was ripped apart quite severely, so... Not sure what happened there, but it was was pretty bad. The area there was just like a, a, a battleground. There was people everywhere, all over the floor, you know, covered in blood and, and whatever. You. And you know, we had station cleaners here actually pouring cold water um, on people's burns. You know, that, that's just the level of. Um, things we were dealing with here and uh, to be honest with you nothing can prepare you for that um, but we just got on with it until the emergency services arrived and uh, then we worked very well as a team together by then Ellen had emerged from Kings Cross station you know it's a miracle really we we're probably only down there for 40 minutes I can remember when I got outside Kings Cross station this is before the phone network died looking at my watch and thinking if I could get a cab I'd only be 15 minutes late, not realising, of course, that, you know, what on earth was going on in London and, you know, everything, because I didn't know anything about why would I? Due to a major emergency in central London today... Across the network, stations were closing down. News had come in of a fourth explosion on a bus. At Hammersmith, the extent of the damage was gradually becoming clear to manager Andy Anthony. What, what exactly is they saying on the news, Brian? There have been a number of casualties, some serious casualties, as well as what the uh, London Ambulance Service termed walking wounded, and there have been a number of fatalities. I'm unable to give you the exact number uh, because things are still relatively confused. All right, all right, Brian. No, thanks for the call, man. Yeah, I'm all right. Cheers. Bye bye. Yeah, if you look at the map of where the blasts have come from, then um, it sort of points in that direction, doesn't it? Coming more this way. So, um, yeah. Anyway, let's not speculate. Let's wait and see what's published. We've never, ever seen something like this before on the underground. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of experience to, to see a, a board that says everything's suspended. Never, ever seen it before. I used to be a um, group station manager at King's Cross. When I heard the news, I was just very, very worried. I did text um, some of the duty station managers that I know up there. Uh, one of whom did get back to me. It was good to know he's OK, because you, you do sort of think about these people when they're, when they're there and feel for them, obviously. There was little more that Andy and his colleague, John Kuman Singh, could do that day. I've been working for, uh, for this company for, for 38 years. And you tend to think of passengers, although they don't, they don't appreciate it, probably they don't appreciate it, but we, we see them as our business. And... Uh, when I drove a train, it was my train. When I uh, my, uh, supervised the station, was I was an inspector. 
supervisor station, it was my station. We here on a group and I'm a manager and I, I work with and I manage at any one time seven stations, they're my stations. And when people start blowing up people and, and, and killing them and pulling our systems down, it's, how, how could you take it? It's like a personal attack. Chaotic to start with, extremely well managed by all the emergency services thereafter. At all four stations, ERU teams worked around the clock to recover the damaged trains. There was bodies everywhere, you know, uh, some holes, some not. First of all, you're worried about where you're walking, you know, because obviously you don't want to disturb anything and uh, also slip as well. But it's mostly shock hits you. Now coming back now thinking about it to you right now, it's, it's actually coming back. And it, it is quite a startling thing to see. Um, we know they're dead, uh, and God help them, but uh, what can you do? You know, you just got to make it as good as best as possible for them. I didn't think I'd been anywhere near a bomb. And then I went and watched the television. I've turned into a real news junkie, and they kept sort of doing this, these sort of, you know, diagrams. And I kept thinking, well, where, where was the train that I was on? There's the train that the bomb was on at King's Cross, but where was the train that I was on? And it suddenly, I can remember, it was about 2.30, I thought, my God, I was on that train. When you come back up into the ticket hall area and you speak to the councillors after, and they say, think about how many people you have saved. It's, um, I suppose you've got to look at the positive side and not the negative side. We've got a job to do and we do it to the best of our ability, you know, and I hope we do do a good job on the day and I hope we don't have to do it again, but if we have to, I think we'll all be here, won't we? Yeah. yeah. They didn't stop and question about their own safety at all. They just, all they wanted to do was help. That's all they wanted. <laughs>